Our gospel reading today is from Matthew. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. We're reading uh, chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. This passage is also the basis for the message this morning. When I was a boy... I have a vague recollection of wanting to catch a bird. I don't even remember what kind of bird it was I wanted to catch, but I wanted to catch a bird. And one of my uncles told me that the way to catch a bird was to sneak up behind it and sprinkle salt on its tail. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? I, I puzzled with that one. Like, I, I couldn't figure out how that was going to help me catch a bird. Frankly, that's one thing that salt probably isn't much good for. <laughs> but salt does have its value. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. I remember one time somebody told me that my friend Alan Zorb was a salt of the earth kind of guy. And I knew what they meant. Uh, when we talk about a salt of the earth person, we mean a person of good character. And yet Jesus said that only God is good. Therefore, any goodness in our lives is the result of being connected to the source of goodness, God himself. There's only one way to be connected to God, and that is through Jesus Christ, his Son. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, the Bible says. No one can come to the Father except through the one who gave himself for us, who sacrificed his body and his blood on the cross, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, salt by itself is not useful, really. Oh, I suppose there's a few things you can do with it, but salt really has its greatest value when it is added to other things, right? right. I mean, I never take a salt shaker and <coughs> just turn it over on my plate, dump out its contents, and eat the salt with a spoon. I, I don't suppose you do either. But I do like to add it to my meat, to my veggies, to, to a lot of different kinds of food. Salt added to other things does some good stuff, doesn't it? I wouldn't want to be without it. Salt is useful when added to other things. We lose our saltiness when we live only for ourselves. If the only question that you have as you look at a new opportunity or a challenge is, what's in it for me? What will I get out of it? That's 
not functioning as salt in the world. If we look only at our own interests, we no longer are good for anything. Self-centered people are not salty. They're useless, really, in God's kingdom. We are here for the purpose of loving God and loving other people. You know, we take salt for granted. But salt actually is a very valuable thing. You can't get along without it. There was a time when caravans traveled across great deserts carrying salt as their cargo. It was valuable. Camel drivers were actually paid with a portion of the salt. And that's where the, that's where the saying comes from, that a man is worth his salt. A person who works well was a person worth their salt. Now, let's think a little bit about some of the things that salt's good for. Salt is good for preservation. Among other things, it keeps meat from spoiling. I like to make uh, venison jerky. I have a dehydrator at home. And uh, when I put those strips of meat into that, I put them in with seasoning, which is, yes, some flavoring, but primarily salt. As it dries out, the salt preserves the meat so that it stays good and edible for a period of time. And it's, it's great for eating later on, you know, maybe as a snack or when you're traveling. Um, it's a good preservative. And salt is used for purification and conditioning. On Friday, I checked our uh, water softener and realized that almost all the salt was gone. So I... On my trip to Saskatoon, picked up 264 pounds of salt for the water softener. I calculated how much it was after I had to carry it all downstairs. <laughs> but it, it does a function um, that results in better water. And salt is used for flavoring. If you don't have salt in your food, it, it's pretty bland, isn't it? Um, when you have God's Spirit in your life, that's what gives you zest for life, enthusiasm to face the day. I, I sometimes sign my letters enthusiastically in Christ. Or, I have an enthusiasm for life because of the Spirit of God in my life. Followers of Jesus exist for others. When you commit your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, in one sense, you're as ready for heaven as you're ever going to be. If you have just accepted Jesus and your life here on earth ends, you go straight to heaven, straight into the presence of Jesus, just like the saint who walked with him for 80 years. So, if we're ready to go to heaven, once we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, why are we still here? The fact is that God leaves us in this world so that we can influence others for Him. If you are still here, and I see that you are, that means that God has not finished with you yet. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old. If you're still here, God is not finished with you yet. He has a purpose for you, and He wants to use you to influence others. Now Jesus not only said that His people are salt, He also said, you are the light of the world. And He went on to say, a town that's built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. If you light a lamp, what do you do? You put it on a, on a stand so that it can illuminate the room. And for what purpose are we to be light in this world? To enable others to see. Light, like salt, is for the benefit of others. The purpose of light is for illumination. 
The Bible talks about good deeds. Sometimes in churches, the importance of good deeds is minimized. That's not intentional. I think it's really a, a reaction. We don't want people to get the idea that if they just do a lot of good deeds, that God's going to take them to heaven. Because having a relationship with God does not result from doing good deeds. But good deeds result from having a relationship with God. We have to be very careful about the order. And Scripture makes it clear that God is interested in the deeds that we do. In the same way, Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Be very careful. Your good deeds are not so that people will think that you are great, but so that they will realize that you love and serve a great God. We have to be careful here. The good deeds that are being talked about are not great big things that you do once in a while so that people will notice. You know, sometimes uh, companies or individuals will make large gifts or bequests or whatever, and it's, it's really more about advertising than it is about meeting a human need. Now, I'm glad those things happen, and a lot of good work gets done that way. But we're, what we're talking about here is not occasional actions, but a way of life where you seek to serve. It's so important that we realize that light always comes from a source. There's no light without a light source. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Any light in our lives is because Jesus lives in us. He says, let your light shine so that others will recognize the source of your good deeds, your Father in heaven, and they'll be inspired to join you in living for his glory. In Isaiah chapter 58, the passage that uh, Ruth read for us earlier, it talks about people who go through all kinds of religious activity, but really don't have a relationship with God. Prayers aren't being answered because the life does not match what goes on in their religious context. Yesterday, when Benjamin was talking to the man, he, uh, he shared very openly about his own story. He said there was a time in his life when he was a Christian, and he would go to church, and everybody there thought he was really, really on fire for God, but then the rest of the week, uh, he was doing things that were not right, hanging out with friends that were getting him in trouble. And uh, he mentioned it on one occasion. A friend said to him, well, are you a Christian? He said, yes. And the guy said, I don't believe it. Never would have guessed that you're a Christian. The talent, and if, let me say, his life has changed since that point. He's living for Jesus and excited about it. But, but the challenge for us is to live in such a way that if people find out we're Christians, they're not going to be shocked. They're going to say, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I could see that. I could tell that you were walking with Jesus. Your lifestyle should be such that people will not be surprised when they learn that you are a Christian, a Jesus follower. So one of the questions we have to ask then is, who are these salt and light people? Well, actually, Jesus tells us because he's just provided the context. Immediately before he talks about being salt and light, he shares what we call the Beatitudes. He teaches that the salt and light people are the people who are poor in spirit. Those who are willing to admit that they need help. God's help. The salt and light people are those who mourn, who go through heartbreak and yet trust God that they can make a comeback. People who are burdened, who hurt, and feel pain when they see others going through suffering. People who are brokenhearted for those who don't know Jesus yet. And the salt and light people are people who are meek, people who are self-controlled, 
emotionally stable, kind, and tender-hearted toward others, compassionate and forgiving. And the salt and light people are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, have a great big inner desire to do the thing that is right, the thing that is right in God's eyes. And then the salt and light people are people who are merciful. <clears throat> what does it mean to be a merciful person? I uh, think of the Dennis the Menace cartoon. Dennis the Menace standing in front of his mother, hands on hips. I demand justice. <laughs> the next frame, he's standing in the corner. And he says, then how about a little mercy? <laughs> Justice is treating people like they deserve. <coughs> Mercy is treating people better than they deserve. Jesus taught us the golden rule. He said, treat other people as you yourself want to be treated. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't know about you, but I desperately hope to be treated better than I deserve. Because if I just get treated like I deserve, I'm going to be in trouble. And if I would like to be treated better than I deserve, then I must also treat other people better than they deserve. That's being a salt and light person. And then Jesus said that the salt and light people are people who are pure in heart. We know that we're all sinners. We all do things that are wrong in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. So how do we become pure in heart? It's only through God's forgiveness. Sometimes we get the idea that we are forgiven because we're sorry for our sin. Now it's true that we become sorry for our sin. But the reason that we're forgiven is because Jesus died on the cross to take the penalty for our sin. He paid the price so that we can go free, so that we can be pure in heart. As often as we realize that we have offended God by our thoughts, words, or actions, we can stop right then, confess it. And the Bible says He's faithful and He's just, and He'll forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when Jesus cleanses a heart, He makes it pure. And then the salt and light people are peacemakers. Those who are willing to work for peace. Peace in relationships, within the family the home, peace in the workplace, in the school, and especially in the church. The people of God should be setting the example of what it means to be a peacemaker. We look for peace in the way that our society treats people, especially those who are less fortunate. And we look for peace and work for peace between the nations of our world. And then, salt and light people are often those who are persecuted. Those who are willing to give of themselves and share Jesus Christ with others. You know, it's possible to be a private Christian and avoid persecution. As long as you don't really say anything or do anything <coughs> that makes people aware of the fact that you're a Jesus follower, you can coast along pretty easily. But, when you share Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's very possible that you will be shunned, scorned, or worse. Jesus said you're blessed. Blessed when you are persecuted for His sake and for the Gospel. So ask yourself today, am I a salt? and life person. That's what Jesus calls you to be. That's who he wants to make you to be. As we come to the table of communion this morning, this is an encounter with Jesus Christ. He comes to us in the wine and the bread. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. And in a spiritual sense, he is with us as we come to communion. I think of the verse that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Wow. What a promise.
let's stop and pray and ask God to make us salt and light people right now and in our lives this week. Father God, we are in your presence. And therefore, we boldly ask what we know you want to give. We ask God that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Make us pure in heart. So that we can come to you. And so that we can share you with others. Thank you for the free gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the body that was broken at the cross, for the blood that was shed. Thank you that the resurrection proves that the debt is paid and that there is life after life. Thank you that we have eternal life through faith in you. Help us, God, to share it, to show it, to bring as many as possible with us when we come to you in glory. Thank you that you're coming back again, and we want to be ready. And now, fathers, we come to this table of communion. May it be a sacred time, a holy time, a time when we are in your presence, consciously, purposefully, being open, changed, transformed by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask those who are assisting with the service of communion to come and